Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. I'll leave this here so you can ask questions as we go along. Okay. So, as you're all aware, we've been in a six-week series um, of study, plus two now. In other words, it's really turned out to be eight weeks, which has been wonderful. And today is the conclusion of our eight-week study of theology and culture. Now, you may ask the obvious question, what's next? Well, what's next is we're going to go back to the big banner that we started with last year, which is how to read the Bible. And that is so important for us that we all learn how to read the Bible well. Because you know as well as I do. Well, you maybe you don't know as well as I do, but at least when I was young and took those comprehension tests, you know, at the end of a reading period, I say this in front of a librarian, so I'm going cautiously, okay? But um, when, when you take those tests at the end and you have to read the long paragraph and you have to answer questions and you get like 65% on comprehension, uh, here I am, okay? It took me a while not to learn to read, but to read productively. Those are two very different things. Oh, I could get through it faster than anyone. And, uh, and then find myself um, unable to <laughs> recall anything or comment on almost anything I read. And then I learned to read extremely slowly. And ironically, that actually has served me well because if you're in the academic discipline of philosophy, reading quickly is not going to help you. You have to go slow. And so you got to learn how to go slow. And you have to learn the techniques of reading well. So it won't be a reading class in that sense, but it will be a class on how to read the Bible well. And so we're going to start with, well, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start with Genesis. No book of the Bible poses more substantial questions for us or deeper questions for us as Christians than the book of Genesis. And so we need to get our heads around that. So Pastor Daniel is going to take two weeks to introduce the, bo the book to us. I'm going to get us kicked off by talking about the first two or three chapters of Genesis. And we're going to have an extended study on the book of Genesis. And believe me, there, there are more substantial issues from the book of Genesis than almost anywhere else in the Bible. And so we'll spend some time on that. So spread the word. Next week, 10 o'clock, Genesis. Okay? Now, for today, um, like I said, we've been in this study of theology and culture for seven weeks. Today is the eighth week. And... I always like to take time at the end of any uh, extended discussion to invite us to perhaps ask the questions that maybe didn't come up for you early on in our conversation, but are still kind of lingering for you that you'd like to ask about. Now you'll remember, we've talked about a lot of subjects in this room. What have we talked about? Let's see who can remember. Money. Money. That was last week. We've talked about money and economics. So we've talked about uh, violence in the interest of justice or self-defense. That was a very good discussion. What else? Sexuality. We talked about sexuality. What else did we talk about? Race. Racial equality. Abortion. Then what was the last, first one we discussed? Y'all are very good. What was the very first? Justice. So all of these topics that have been very much, uh, shall we say, in the limelight culturally, we've had a conversation Christianly about those big topics. All right, so today um, doesn't mean we ha don't have things we can talk about, but I'm very interested in your considered 
questions or comments. And so, uh, Bonnie, I think you have one already, so go well, ahead. It's just information for people. For those of you that were here last week and have a concern about the panhandlers that are all over the county, you may have known that um, enough citizens complained that the chairman of the Board of Supervisors actually asked the citizens to not give money to them in the hope that they would go away. That did not work. <laughs> They're on every corner every time I go by. So last week, Sam mentioned cards, and we keep these out at the information desk. I'll put them over here for you. These are cards that list all of the uh, resources that are available to homeless people and low-income people in our area. And so I do often stop and, and give uh, something to the people on the corner, but I also give them one of these cards. Okay. And so that uh, helps a little. Uh, Molly mentioned last week that uh, what they often do is get Subway gift cards, and instead of giving cash, they give a gift card. You can buy those through our script ministry, and then you benefit two ministries in one. Right. <laughs> Missions That's right. in one. That's right. And also keep in mind that you do not feel, need to feel guilty at all if you choose not to, to do that. They should not be there in the first place. But you also are helping people all the homeless people in Fairfax County that take advantage of the services because Parkwood supports the Lamb Center and FACETS and the affordable housing program through your giving. So you are, are doing a lot, and the reason I like to do it that way is because there's accountability. Right. There are rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'll put these over here. You can pick them up. If you choose to, you can give them away. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Um, any comments or any questions about some of our topics? Yes. Well, first of all, I just want to say again, um, I, I thank you, Pastor Daniel and Pastor John, for having the courage to talk about these topics. We, we, we really need more discussion. We know that. We know that, you know, because of our questions, and I'll throw myself in there too, you know, we took time away from you all. but. Um, I would encourage anybody who's just starting the service, uh, starting the series to go back and relook at these videos to talk to their families about this. Um, I don't think there was one topic you, you all discussed that I did not find somebody else to talk to about. It's very, um, it's very eye-opening. It pulled at my heart. I think it pulled in my heart for so far some real positive ways. So I just really wanted to say thank you and I hope I hope the church continues to talk about the very things that we tend not to talk about because we don't want to have differing opinions or um, I, don't, I don't know what to I just want to say thanks. Sure, sure. Um, any other questions? Come on now. <laughs> I'm so unknowledgeable. Okay, it's, it's a general question. Sure. Old Testament and New Testament. Right. Old Testament is very violent to me. A lot of violence. New Testament, and I, I'm not a biblical scholar, so I don't know, but I don't remember Jesus talking too much about violence, or he seems to be more against it. And I've always looked at the Old <laughs> Testament as kind of historical, or at least showing us how we got from there to here. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, I have a hard time reconciling the two. Yeah. Well, um, like I said, Pastor Daniel will be here next week to explain the... <laughs> and you tell him I said that. Well, th let, me, let me assure you, first of all, that the tension that you feel when you read the scriptures uh, in what some people might characterize as the, is, is, is the way God seems to come off in the Old Testament and the way God seems to come off in the New Testament look, um, they, they look very different in, in the ways that you've just described. So much so that if, if you were to go way back in Christian history, all the way back to the first several generations of the church, one of the biggest challenges that emerged early was uh, the idea that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. Um, his name was Marcion, and he was a very persuasive figure 
who was trying to uh, argue for a way of thinking about God that he thought was more consistent with who he took Jesus to be, believing then that the God of the Old Testament can't be the same God. Now, after the church wrestled over this issue, and, and, and we can certainly discuss that, this issue uh, in the ensuing weeks, uh, once, once the church got its head around this question, um, it came to the conclusion that this view, though it seems tempting, is ultimately confused because the Jesus that we have in the New Testament is emerging from the history and theology and uh, religious uh, culture of the Old Testament. Now, we have to remember that from the book of Daniel until Jesus, there's a bit of a gap, right? It appears to be a 500-year gap. It's not really a 500-year gap. We've discussed this before. The book of Daniel was written around, it was written in the 2nd century B.C., um, in other words, before, before Christ. And, but it was about things going on in the 6th century. So much in the way that the movie MASH is set in the Korean War, it's actually about the Vietnam War. Well, the book of Daniel, even though it appears to be about Daniel and God's people in exile in Babylon, the story is told in order to deal with what was happening to the people who were living in Judea. How the Jews were meant to live under God in Judea during the Greek um, empire that was, well, it wasn't uh, Ptolemy, it wasn't the Egyptian, it was the Syrian version of the Greek empire that had imposed a lot of restrictions on the Jews in Jerusalem and in Judea. So my point is, is that because we have this perceived historical gap, we sometimes think, well, there's this big break. The break's not quite as big as it appears, but psychologically, oftentimes, we want to see one is this and one is that. But theologically, when we read the New Testament, we're able to see, you might say, from the person of Jesus back into the history of God's of, of God's people and what God is up to. So uh, does God oftentimes look wrathful? Absolutely. Does God oftentimes seem to be doing things that's, that look um, horrific? Uh, particularly during certain times during the history of the people of Israel? Absolutely. Um, how do we contend with that? Um, we have, to, we have to begin with understanding uh, what it is that God is up to throughout the history of the Bible. And, and so in order to get to the answer of your question, we would have to go back to Genesis, right? And we have to see what it is that God is trying to overcome with his people. You know, God is certainly in a position to impose, right? But God chooses not to impose. But that distance oftentimes uh, creates the conditions for the possibility of chaos. And that chaos often comes as a result, not of God, but of us. And so we have to uh, go through the scriptures very carefully and be sure that we're paying attention to what God is up to in relationship to his people, who for God are going to be the vehicle 
of fixing the problems that we are going to encounter in, create, in, in the story of uh, Adam and Eve and subsequent families. So, so you know, there's, it, it's, it's going to be an important topic when we get to Genesis. We're going to talk about families, right, and how families operate. You know, you start reading the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're like, okay, did God actually choose this bunch to get stuff done? I mean, are these the people we're going to count on for the future of the promises of God? And see how they reacted to God. Sometimes it's horrible. And yet, it's just like something I said in a sermon a few weeks ago. You know when Peter lops off the ear of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, chief priest, the servant of the chief priest? I called him the deputy sheriff in that sermon. That's what he was there to do. He was going to enforce the, the, the law. I mean, Peter cut the dude's ear off. I mean, crazy and violent, right? But yet Jesus makes him... This dude, the founder of the church? I mean, think about that. How upside down things are sometimes when God gets involved. And how he takes our our clear moral sanctity and and, um, and self-confidence and turns it on its head. And forces us to look at things that to our eyes look like, oh, what can you do with that? And they become the very foundation of doing the most profound things. Now, we already know this. Everything I've just said, we know it intuitively. We just always forget it. And, and just to give you, you know, the biggest example of all, the pulpit here is designed as a cross. There's no image in the history of humanity more violent than a cross, right? Right? And yet, we call the vents of that cross victory. And so we have to see how God is taking the worst of the worst and inverting it for his purposes. He's not saying it's good. He's inverting it for the purposes of bringing, literally, salvation to the world. And the point of it is is that No matter how bad it gets in any situation, in any circumstance, with any person, God's grace can redeem what is most screwed up. And so that's why, remember I said you got to go slow. Sure, you can read over all that stuff in the Old Testament. It's like, well, well, that's ugly. But you've got to read it carefully. And you've got to go slow. And you've got to see how God's at work in each of these uh, stories, each of these families, each of these events. And when you do that, it's kind of, then the impression is rather staggering. Amazing sometimes. You think, wow, I've never seen that before. But there it is. So I, that was a long explanation. But... It, it, that's a great question. It's an old question. It's been around a long time. And it caused a lot of trouble in the early part of the life of the church. But uh, we've, been, we've been wrestling with it ever since. All right, other questions? Anybody? Come on now. Well, I have a question. Yeah. One of our family members... Um, there you go. Ask me, ask me one day, and I didn't, kind of out of the blue. She said, why do people say God is so good with uh-huh. all the stuff that's going on? Right. And I, you know, I didn't really have the answer right away. I thought about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, yes. Like, like uh, Ray's question, um, yeah, that is one of the biggest questions of all. Why do people say that God is good? When, in other words, why do bad things happen to good people? Right. Or to, if we were to, if we were having an intro to philosophy of religion class, it would be okay. 
So if God is all powerful and God is all good and God is all loving, then how is it that there's evil in the world? Because if there is evil in the world, and I think we'd all confess that there is, then either God's not powerful enough to do anything about it, or he's not good and love. He really doesn't uh, believe that good, goodness or love is at the heart of what he's about. So it's either he's diminished in power or he's diminished in goodness, you know, if evil's in the world. That's the way people construct this thing. And, um, of course, from all the way back, as far as we can think about these things, God as we know God, and know God from both the Old and New Testament, God is considered and understood as good. But God isn't good in the way that people are good. Okay? See, people are contingently good. They are relatively good. Um, but God is, we, we would say God is absolute goodness. Or, another way to put it, would say God is... Um, Good with a capital G. We always appeal to a capital letter when we want to emphasize something really important, right? So God is good with a capital G. Um, how do you, quote, know that, right? That's, that's how the question comes to us as, as modern believers. How do you know God is good? Well, um, let me see if... I, I want to I say this in a way that um, that makes it easy to see the difference. Um, there are in our thinking sometimes what are called category mistakes. Uh, we, we perceive something and we speak of something and when we speak of it that way we have identified it in a category that's not fitting to the thing that it is. And I think I gave you this example before. So somebody goes to take their kid to the university, right, for the first time. But they've never been on a university campus. They don't even know what a university campus is. And so they're wandering around, and they go to see the library. They go to see the refectory. They go to see the dormitories. They go to see the football stadium. They go to see all these places. And when they come back, um, and they meet up with the group, you know, parent raises their hand, they said, well, I got to see all these places, but where is the university? That's called a category mistake. In other words, they think the university is a kind of thing like a library or a, a educational building or a gymnasium or whatever. No, the, uni the, the university is a different kind of thing. It is this kind of abstract notion of a much wider reality, okay? So, it becomes very easy for us when we're talking about God to talk about God as if God's a person. Now, before anybody gets all upset, well, God is a person. We have a personal relationship. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes, God is a person in that sense, in that God's loving, uh, that God is intervenes, that God does things. Yes, God's a person in that sense. But God is not to be equated in any sense with being like a human being. And so when we, yeah, we'll get back to that. No, 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 no. That's where we're going to end up. So, so, when, so when we think about God, um, it, it's like when we were talking about the Bible as God's word and, and the Bible's authority. You know, people want to say, well, the Bible's true with a capital T. God, the Bible, the word of God is true. Well, nobody's saying it's not. But what kind of truth is it? And the mistake we make is that we think the Bible's true in the sense that we can go out there and show you how it's true by, yes, let's, go, let's, do, it, let's do an expedition to, uh, you know, Mount Ararat and let's find, uh, let's, find the, um, let's find the ark. As if that were the kind of truth it was. Well, no, it's a much deeper and more profound truth than that. It's more like if you've got a yardstick, right? And you were 
going to measure a bunch of things. Um, let, let's say you were to go, when, when I was a kid, my mother did something to me that I'm still not over. She, she yes. Um, if you see her, don't bring it up. Um, but they used to have these things called um, fabric stores. Do you know what a fabric store mm -hmm. is? I don't know. <laughs> but he's like, oh, that boy was raised right. <laughs> she would take me to the fabric store. I hated going to the fabric store. Why? Because it was about fabric. I hated talking, well, I wasn't talking about it. I was usually just running around trying to find some way to amuse myself. And they'd pull out these bolts of cloth. Remember? They called them bolts. They don't look like bolts, but they're called bolts of cloth. And they'd roll the thing out. And my mother would get excited about this one or that one. And I'm like, okay. But they would pull out what? A yardstick to measure the bolts of cloth. Now, what if I had gone up to the lady and my mother and said, what are you doing? We're measuring the fabric to make sure we have the right length. Well, what if I said, how do you know the measuring stick's the right length? <laughs> Category mistake. We can ask that question. We can ask the question, how do you know that a measuring stick's the right length? But it makes no sense because the measuring stick is the thing with which you measure. It's the basis of our measuring. And so you can't use the basis of the measure to ask about whether it's the right measure because it's the thing that measures. That's the same of the Bible and more particularly, even more so of our talk about God. You can't ask if God's good because God is the very essence of goodness. And so if you're thinking about God or if you're inclined to ask that question, well, how, and, and there's two answers to this. On the one hand, you can't ask of God if God's good if you understand who God is, right? Because it makes no sense. But on the other side of that, thing, you have to attend to the human reaction that is, why does God let this happen? And the reality is, is that usually when people express that deep um, question, they're not looking for that kind of answer. What do I mean by that? So just imagine someone coming, is coming home from a play and they're driving at night and they're hit by a drunk driver and you can well imagine the spouse of whoever it was that was killed would ask the question why has this happened or ask God why has this happened well when they ask why has this happened um, they're not asking about the mechanics of the event. They're not asking um, for an answer that gives an explanation of the physics of this car hitting that car at a high rate of speed and the effects of that on the body. Because you could, I mean, that would be appropriate in a courtroom perhaps. But the question they're asking is, has to do with, you might say, the meaning, is there any meaning in all of this? Um, because the answer is the reason, you know, why did they die? Well, they died because they got hit by another car at a certain speed. That's the answer. If that's the kind of question is, but that's not the, it's another. If you think that's what they're asking, then you're missing it. And if you think God is kind of the explanation in the way that, that, talking about the car uh, and the speed it's going is a kind of explanation, then you've missed how God factors into this equation. No, it has to do with the me what is the meaning of these, this event to lose someone that's that close to you? And that's precisely where 
talk about God can come in and does come in. Because oftentimes we say, I don't know. What I do know is that God loves you. And I do know that you're going through enormous pain right now. And I can't tell you how or why this has happened. But I do know, and and please don't answer that question this way. I know God has a plan. No, 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 no. It's, I know God loves you, and God is a good God, and I pray that in time um, you'll be able to understand what's happened here. Um, To go farther than that is to say too much. Um, You'll remember that when uh, Jesus was um, in his worst moment, you remember that. I mean, he's sweating blood. Uh, when he was in his worst moment, and he cried out, nobody's closer to God the Father than Jesus, right? And when he cried out, what answer did he get? Nothing. No answer. The point being that despite the fact that there was no answer, Jesus nonetheless handed his life over to his father's will. And the significance of that showed itself over time. And so when someone experiences these profound losses, um, it's, it's better just to sit with them than to try to explain it, because there is no explanation. And to, to allow... God, over time, to show them or allow them to see how what's happened has deep meaning for their life and for where, they're, where they are in their own um, uh, faith journey. Um, but, but we don't ever want to talk about God having a plan in that sense because it looks like then God designed a pretty ugly plan. And God doesn't operate like that. So I don't know if that helps at all, but that's... It it does, yeah. I think she was focused on all this stuff in the news, not necessarily a personal No, no, no. I I get it. I get it. Yeah, why does... I I had a gentleman (laughs) come to me years ago who uh, had... It's hard to believe, but uh, he and I started talking. He had been coming to the church about six months. And uh, every Sunday, he just seemed so constrained. You know, how you see folks and they're going through a difficult time and every hymn, every prayer, he just looked gripped. He was about 83 years old. Well, um, he wanted to talk. After about three months, he, he wanted to talk. So we started meeting on Tuesdays. And we met every Tuesday and, and chatted. And, I, and, and he led with, why does God let all this stuff happen? Why? But for him, at least, the heart of that question was his own relationship with God and how he was feeling burdened by the world's evil. He's burdensome. And in his personal situation, um, he revealed, again, over weeks and months of conversation, His job during the Kennedy administration was very unpleasant. Um, He was a hired assassin by the United States government. And he had to go do things that were terrible. But he did them for the sake of uh, what the government was trying to achieve, or at least the administration was trying to achieve. And he was was in Cuba. Uh, He was in uh, uh, North Korea. And he... uh, Ultimately, he was here in D.C. working uh, undercover with the mob. And he had to do a lot of things that none of us would ever, ever, ever be okay with. And so he was struggling. As, Why does God let the world be like it is? So I had to do the things I had to do to keep the world safe. Why? And I said, brother, I can't tell you in advance what that 
means for you. What I can tell you is, is when we find ourselves saying yes to God, then it gives a very different light to all that's going on and all that's happened. And he went from being, and so one Sunday, it just shocked the daylights out of me. He starts coming down the aisle at the end of the service. And, and he just said yes to God. In other words, he said yes in the midst of his own confusion and frustration and heartache. He just surrendered, basically. He said, God, I can't figure it out. I don't understand it. But he said yes to God. Then he went from being a man who was bitter and hurt and fearful and angry about the world he, he literally became the, the strongest encourager of faith for everybody in that congregation. And he gave a testimony that would just rock the house. It's the only time I've ever seen someone give a personal testimony and an entire church just erupt with what God... But he said, I mean, his tagline was, you can love God again. In other words, if you've suffered these evils, if you've suffered this heartache, if you've been through this stuff, then, then you can live in close relationship with God again. It doesn't have to ruin you. It doesn't have to rob you of the meaning of life. It doesn't have to take from you what matters most. God can give all that back to you. But... See, he wanted, he wanted God to show him and explain to him in advance what were the, you know, what are the benefits of, do, you know, surrendering to you. And God demanded that he surrender to him. And then he saw what it was that God was doing. But you can't reverse the order. And the reason you can't is because God's not a human being. He's not there to be persuaded. He's not there to be cajoled. He's not there to be told how things are supposed to work. No, it goes the exact opposite direction. You know, we, we have to give ourselves to what God is doing in us and around us. And it's only on the heels of that that you, it's like, oh, that's what you're up to. That's what this means. That's why this matters. Um, and it's one of the hardest things in faith to, to appreciate because we all want, you know, we all want the, we all want to count the cost. I'm going to preach about this today, so I don't want to get into my sermon. But, um, but, but, you know, we all want to count the cost. But it's not a matter of addition. That's the irony. It's the irony in what Jesus says. He says you've got to count the cost, but really you're not counting anything. Yes, sir. So... What's the rest of the story after he gave his testimony? Yeah. Is he still killing people? Oh, no, no, no. He was 83 years old. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had given that up a long time ago. But, no, no, the, the, uh, en the well, end of the story is... It would be interesting is... to know if he was younger yeah. and he came to you and he, and he gave his life over to God yeah. and he still had to do his work and he's watching somebody in his crosshairs, what's he thinking? Well, again... That's a human being. All right. A again, it would uh, depend precisely on what God's doing with that person. And, you know, you can't... You know, we become terribly prescriptive as Christians. You know, we look at a situation and we want to we prescribe for everybody how things ought to go. And... I would recommend a very different um, orientation. Take the situation you're in and then surrender to what you take to be God's grace in the midst of that. If you do that, it often requires you to do precisely the thing you don't want to do. You know, so, you know let's say you've got a neighbor that is deeply problematic and... Uh, you have to, uh, what? Let's say you have a neighbor that's deeply problematic and it's, it, it's becoming, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing, you know, for you and your family. And the one thing you don't want to do is have to contend with them. 
And, but obviously, God has shown us over and over again that that's precisely what will be required of you, more than likely, is to have to contend. And by contend, I mean you have to, be, you have to go and be open to them. You have, to, you have to go and open yourself up to this person that you can't stand. Now, that's just a neighbor. It's a lot worse when it's family, right? <laughs> I'm serious. It's rough. I got them in mind. Um, to be open to people, you just, you know, just, ooh. and every time you're around them, it's like, Lord, deliver me, or please don't put me in a place to have to do that again. And that's just, as soon as you get there, you're, he's going to give you an opportunity to do exactly what you don't want to do. So you're either going to surrender or you're going to suffer. It's up to you. But I'm serious. You either surrender or you suffer. And if you surrender, the, 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 the testimonies that I get are of, I had no idea. I mean, you just see God transforming situations that you, had, you believed had to have one kind of, of um, uh, resolution. When the reality is you needed... God's resolution. And God's resolution does not look like the resolution in your head. More, more often than not. Because our head wants us to be very prescriptive in how we deal with people. You know, here's, the, here's what you got to do. And, you know, it, it gets really litigious and nasty that way. And the funny thing is, is that Jesus was seldom prescriptive. We think it's prescriptive because we want to read it that way, but usually he was just describing an alternative reality into which you're invited. And you can either come in or you can stay out there. That's up to you. But he, he was describing an alternative reality. And you can either become part of the kingdom, right? See, everybody seems to think that becoming part of the kingdom is just basically another name for you know, getting your ticket punched to go to heaven. No, no, no. You're entering the realm of God when you're invited into the kingdom. And you live differently, you respond differently, you think differently, but it doesn't come easy. You have to learn to do these things. But it's run by God, or as we say, particularly evangelicals say, it's run by the Lord Jesus. So if the Lord Jesus is in charge, how you do things is going to look very different than if you were in charge. I promise you. It's going to look very different. Good grief. It's already 1025. Okay, any other questions or comments? Please. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. It's on. I have no, no like a speaking like a pastor. <laughs> but I, I don't have a question. Okay. But... I, it reminds me what I have experienced uh, with God. Yes. Because uh, I gave my testimony like uh, three weeks ago. Yes. And I became become a Christian because of the uh, Lord saved me, my life. Right. When I was suiciding in the lake, mm. he literally walked through the lake and I s met him face to face, but I want to tell you why people telling the God is good, but why bad thing is happening. I lived that life. Why I was doing that such a extreme actions, because um, uh, long story short, I cut short, um, second year of university, yes. I got raped mm. by my colleague, one of colleague. So I did not know what, how to resolve. Uh, I lived in Korea. My, uh, that time, Korea was very like uh, reserved. So if a woman is not virgin, you cannot marry. Right, <laughs> right. So I, I was educated like that yeah. in my family. And I believe that. Mm. But when I got raped, and I didn't know how to resolve. Mm. That's why I decided to vengeance to this man. Mm. 
So mm. whole my university, I have mind in how to vengeance right. this man. So I, I followed this man and ask him, you should take responsibility, what yeah. you have done to me. But I didn't want to marry this man because I, I didn't love him. Right. But it was too terrible relationship and he hated me, he beat me and I was following him. Mm. And I thought I'll marry him, I'll revenge entire his life. Right. That was, my, and then my life become miserable and all darkness, I was peace to heaven and why I'm living like this. Right. And always I, I got beaten by him and I didn't know what to do. It was like hell and I didn't believe God. So right. I think there's no God, no result, you know. So why I live? The mm. best way to kill myself. So mm. That's why I went there. But all that years I lived like hell. Mm. And because of that hell, I went to kill myself, the lowest point which is your life no longer value. There I met the Lord. Right, right. And what Lord not only saved in my life, but he's so good. Mm. He always with me, even till today. Mm. After I met him, everything resolved? No. I lost everything. Lord told me to leave everything. Mm. So I became a, like a penniless. Mm. I lost my house and everything I left. The world point of view, my life was like miserable. Yeah. And she paled and she's like, a, no longer res respecting me. I don't want to hold this time too long. No, but it's fine. anyway, but I obeyed him. Right. And I didn't feel no longer like a world point of view. I was miserable. I, what I was so joyful because I met the Lord. Lord told me to leave everything. So right. I trusted in him. I left everything. I was penniless, but I never starved. I never hung. You know, he, he paid me the best food. He, he gave me ride the best car. You know, it was amazing when I obeyed Lord. Right. So I'm not scared to be like uh, hungry again because if Lord told me to leave. Right. So he trained me like that. So I believe that when time is terrible, there is a hope. There is some plan. Right. For that person right. to save, because this world is too fallen, that we we born into this deceptive world, so we are like born with sin. I was thinking people are good, but the, this world says <laughs> our heart is wicked, right, and so deceitful, right. So if we follow even our heart. We cannot follow God because our heart is up and down. Yeah. One day is good, one day is bad. But if we trust in Him, He will lead you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Your life can change like a, I cannot even express. Right. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. You know, every now and then you just have to say what she said, yeah. you know, right? <laughs> you know, what she said. Uh, because this is what I'm talking about. You know, I was telling you about my friend who came to the Lord after years of anguish over the world being what it was. And when he just surrendered to God, it all turned the other direction. And you see it over and over and over again. So... Thank you all. We will reconvene next week and begin our new study at uh, 10 o'clock. And I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.